here is a book which may be bought at any bookshop for a shilling or so. It's still a bestseller, millions of copies being issued every year. The Bible. And this edition, called the Authorized Version, is one of England's special glories. It's a masterpiece of English literature, ranking even above Shakespeare for its exquisite beauty and simplicity. Throughout the English-speaking world, its words and phrases are part of our heritage. 400 years ago, people were forbidden to possess a Bible in the English language. Our present liberty to read this authorized version is due to the inspired and heroic work of one man, William Tyndale. William Tyndale's name is chief among those who are referred to in this phrase, for no less than 80% of the translation was his. He devoted his life to this work, most of which had to be done in exile, and his reward was prison and the flames. His birthplace and the story of his early days are unknown. His biographer simply states that he was born about the borders of Wales. This description includes the shores of the River Severn in Gloucestershire and is in accord with the tradition of more than 300 years that somewhere in that vicinity, Tyndale was born about the year 1492. From all around this countryside, the traveller may see a prominent landmark. High on a spur of one of the Cotswolds and overlooking the village of North Nibley, there stands this monument erected to his memory. seven in the distance, the monument overlooks one of the loveliest parts of England, the traditional scene of Tyndale's boyhood. A probable birthplace is the parish of Slimbridge, where the ancient parish church still stands, much as Tyndale would have seen it. Nesting in the trees behind the church is the vicarage and delightful Old World Garden. Originally, this vicarage paid for the May morning celebrations at Magdalen College, Oxford, where the choristers still ascend the tower at sunrise to sing in the day. This is interesting, for in later years, Tyndale himself went to study at Oxford. Today, in the Hartford Hall, there hangs this portrait of him. Its Latin inscription may be translated thus. This canvas represents, which is all that art can do, the likeness of William Tyndale, formerly student and pride of this hall, who, after reaping here the happy first fruits of a purer faith, devoted his energy at Antwerp to the translation of the New Testament into the native language. The gateway of Erasmus at Oxford is a relic of Tyndale's university days. Tyndale was greatly influenced by the teaching of Erasmus, to whom we owe the first New Testament to be printed in Greek. The third edition of this work was to help Tyndale in his English translation some years later. At the time that the Renaissance, or Great Revival of Learning, was making itself felt in Oxford, Erasmus had gone to Queen's College, Cambridge, as Professor of Divinity and of Greek. Not long afterwards, Tyndale followed him, for in Oxford there was a great deal of outspoken suspicion and criticism of what was called the New Learning. Perhaps also the peace and tranquility of these dignified surroundings attracted him to Cambridge. Here was the environment in which he could study Greek with Erasmus and listen to his lectures. Tyndale was already an ardent reader of Erasmus, to whom he may well have owed the first real impulse towards his life's task of translating the Bible into English. Today we may stand in this quadrangle at Cambridge and see what is known as the Tower of Erasmus and the window of the study which still bears that scholar's name. back to the wooded slopes of the Cotswolds and Tyndale's home country. In due course, he was ordained and became chaplain and tutor to the family of Sir John Walsh at the manor house of Little Sodbury. Here he was treated as a personal friend. He met and conversed with important people, and many a debate and argument arose around the table of the great hall. Here is Tyndale's private room as it is today. 
through the window of this room may be seen among the trees the remains of the little church of St. Adeline where Tyndale ministered as chaplain. Many of the materials of the church of St. Adeline were used in building the present parish church in a position more accessible to the villagers. The whole district's rich in memories and still echoes with the name of William Tyndale. Not far away, in the great city of Bristol, Tyndale had been preaching to the people gathered on College Green. As a result, the clergy accused him of heretical teaching. He was acquitted, but the trial only strengthened his resolution to make the scriptures available to everybody in their own language. He decided to leave the manor house of Sudbury and to go to London. Nothing without bribery. He has succeeded once. There. This letter to Sir Harry Gilbert should at least ensure that our good friend has some influence in London. You think he will secure the patronage of the bishop? I do indeed. Lord Dunstall is himself a friend of Erasmus and must surely welcome one so versed in his writing. It grieves me that he has to leave us. I can find it in my heart to wish he was not so bold in declaring his opinion. I fear for him. It is God's work that he devises. And God hath blessed him with such a courage and such a resolve that neither I, his dear friend, nor you, nor yet even his enemies could move him from his purpose. So be it then. Why, young master, what brings you to this quarter of the house? Is Master Tyndale within his room? He is. And if Mistress Howard discovers you here... I know my errand. Pardon? As you please. this party. But my father does speak as though a misfortune may befall you. Do not be afraid for me, my son. No misfortune can befall me that I have not already met and vanquished in my heart. Why have you to leave me? Listen, my child. You have marked the scriptures that I've read you and the stories I've told you. Yes, indeed, sir. And yet, had I not been here, you would not have learnt of them. For none is to be read in our English language. So, I go now to London, where, God willing, I will write down all that I have told you, and more besides, that not only you and I may know these beautiful things, but every soul in England may read them for himself. Come, Peter, we must have courage. I cannot find the boy, my lady. He was here with us but a few moments gone. You had better search for him again, my good woman. Uh, he is to say farewell to Master Tyndale. Well, friend, the time has come. I thank you, and you, gracious lady, with all my heart for the kindness you have shown me. We are indeed loath to part from you. It grieves me to be going. But I must not tarry here longer. 
God further your designs and bring them to fulfillment. He will. And your prayers shall aid me. Farewell. God bless you, my children. Here is the letter for Sir Harry. May it serve you. I thank you again for it. It is indeed a noble work you are embarked on. God spoke in the English language. If God spare my life, ere many years I will cause a boy that driveth the plough shall know more of the scriptures than our priests do. But the London Tyndale came to was very different from the London of today. Yet here as elsewhere, the past and present side by side are symbolized by scenes such as these. If we turn from the busy London streets into the library of St. Paul's Cathedral, we may see the result of Tyndale's labor and devotion, his first edition of the New Testament in English. Only one other copy of this edition remains in existence. St. Paul's pillar outside the cathedral reminds us that as many copies as possible were bought by the authorities to be publicly denounced and committed to the flames near this spot. Tyndale's work was destined not to be fulfilled in England. At his meeting with the Bishop Tunstall, he was turned away coldly but courteously. Bitterly disappointed, he started to preach in the church of St. Dunstan's in the West. Here, his sermons attracted the interest of a wealthy cloth merchant by the name of Humphrey Monmouth, who very soon befriended him in his hour of need. Monmouth insisted that Tyndale should dwell in his household as a private chaplain. This was in the parish of All Hallows Barking. While residing here, Tyndale came to the conclusion that not only was there no room in my Lord of London's palace to translate the New Testament, but also that there was no place to do it in all England. With Monmouth's financial help, he planned to go to the continent where the Reformation was making great strides. Monmouth owned a wharf on the very site now occupied by Cannon Street Station. At this wharf, they planned that Tyndale's New Testament should be brought into the country, concealed in bales, and then distributed. Monmouth was to suffer for his sympathy with this work, for later on he was arrested on suspicion and imprisoned in the Tower of London. At that time, the dreaded tower was the abode of many helpless victims of the Reformation. But happily for Monmouth, he was able to secure release. Little remains today of Tyndale's brief sojourn in London, but this monument in the Thames Embankment Gardens is an abiding memorial to his memory and the devotion he bestowed on his task. And so, sometime about May 1524, Tyndale sailed for Hamburg never to see his native land again. Hamburg today is a foremost European port and a magnificent city of commerce. 
It's a town of great attraction with many beautiful buildings. More important, this modern Hamburg has not replaced the old. The present and past again dwell side by side. This part of the town is known as the New Town, but the old town presents another interesting aspect with its ancient buildings intersected by Venetian-like waterways. A great many of these picturesque dwellings and warehouses date back to Tyndale's time. Near the waterfront, where he first set foot on foreign soil, is the ancient house believed to be that of Mistress Van Emerson. Tyndale obtained lodging in this house, and amid these humble surroundings, he set himself earnestly to the work of translation. He remained here for nearly a year, and then went on to Wittenberg. Wittenberg was a great Reformation town and the life center of the work of Martin Luther. Today it's a town of pilgrimage, full of historical monuments and relics of the days when Tyndale resided here. While the Reformation was making its way across Europe, Tyndale continued his task of translating, finding delight in such an atmosphere. In the University Church of Wittenberg, he would have heard Luther preach, his lion voice echoing through the crowded building. Much of the cathedral has since been altered, but the original pulpit from which Luther preached may yet be seen in the town museum. This museum was once the university home of Luther. It now contains a large collection of manuscripts by famous reformers and many examples of early printing. In strange contrast, there's even a collection of films dealing with the Reformation. Of special interest is Luther's own workroom with all the original furnishings perfectly preserved. Nearing the completion of his work, Tyndale now returned to Hamburg to collect a further sum of money sent from England by his good friend Monmouth. He had also to arrange for the printing of his work, and so he went to Cologne to the renowned printing establishment of Quentel and Bergmann. Nothing remains of this house today, but it was close to the river and adjacent to the old dwellings on the waterfront which date back to that period. Cologne was hostile to Luther's reforms, but Tyndale had enough money to compensate the printers for any risk they were taking on his behalf. The works were almost in the shadow of the cathedral spires, which at that time were being built. Tyndale came here in secret and prepared to print 3,000 copies of the Testament. The work was actually in progress when one night there came an interruption. Forbids our printing altogether. Look, there is mentioned here of treason. What treason can there be to the Senate or the city of Cologne in printing an English book? Here, Prince Sergeant, this will warm. Aye, thank you. <laughs> what know you of all this? It is little I can tell you, saving that the information was laid by a priest. Master Cockluas? Aye, Cockluas. That was his cognomen. But he has worked with us. Aye, indeed. So he said. What hurt have we done him? He comes here to correct his pages. That is so, but... Ah, a blunder, my masters, if I may make so bold. But it was while here that he learned of this bigger work that you were engaged on, of the Englishman named Tyndale. But... Trees? There is no law against our printing this book? Maybe not. But Master Cockroach was right down back against you and this man, Tyndale. He declared that the whole matter was highly treasonable against the king and all the bishops of England. 
Know ye what further measure the clerk hath in mind to take? That I do not, nor when he will effect it. Anything I have said, my masters? I have said the term limits. Fear not, friend sergeant. We shall not repeat it. Will ye? I bid you good night. Good night. We have bad news. An order from the Senate. I learned of it. That is why I am come. Come, my friends. This is a grievous blow. I do not dispute it. But much of the book is already in print. How did you learn of this order? Your assistant, good master Sex, told me of it. Sex? Master Cochleus feigned friendship with him, inviting him to his house and plying him with wine. Whereupon Sex did unwittingly give away our secret. Our own assistant. He shall be dismissed tomorrow. I beg of you to forgive him. He hath always shared most diligently in our great task. I beg you that this deed shall not now be held against you. Tis you, friend William, he hath most agreed. Then listen, for there is no time to lose. At any moment the magistrate's officers may return and seize all that we have printed. Are we to hide it? Help me. All these pages must be collected and parceled. When shall we take I sent my helper, Roy, down to the wharf. He is to charter any vessel, even if it be a wherry. I am resolved to carry them up the river, beyond the reach of all the magistrates and spies of Cologne. It is a good plan. But the storm, brother. In this weather, there will be none abroad to question our burden. A new sheet. And Joseph also ascended from Galilee unto Jewry, into a city of David, which is called Bethlehem. It indeed looks well. It is right. Here is your captain, Master Tyndale, ready to sail with us up or downstream. Can you take us to Worms, Master? Aye, sir, if that be your port. And how soon can we sail? As soon as you board my craft. But it'll be a rough night, I warn you. Methinks the house is watched. We passed an officer for at Wellings back. The fellow believed himself hidden, but the, the doorway disappointed him. The window. Could we not pass the bales through the window into the alley? Tis a notion. We have a rowboat at the steps. Then you, and you, Master, go now. Bid farewell to us at the door. Then when all is clear, go into the alley, and we will pass the bales out to you. We'll thwart on land the bishop's flock by taking to the Rhine by boat. Uh, I thought of that cup that we suckled up from the river. I pray you give all your mind to our predicament. Good night, sir. Tyndale landed at Worms somewhere about October 1525. In those days, Worms was a more important town than Cologne and enjoyed almost equal trade facilities with England. 
No time would be lost in resuming the work interrupted at Cologne, for here was the printing house of Peter Schaffer. Worms is one of the oldest towns in Germany. Many of her Roman walls and fortifications still remain as Tyndale saw them. In this haven he had nothing to fear, for Worms was loyal in its support of the Reformation and harbored no interfering magistrates. With his sheets from Cologne, Tyndale was able to make rapid progress during the winter. By the spring of 1526, he'd completed and printed with Peter Schoeffer some 6,000 copies of the New Testament. One of the presses and some of the work of this house may now be seen in the Gutenberg Museum. And here is a copy of Tyndale's quarto edition of the New Testament, which was completed at Worms. The precious volumes were concealed in bales of cloth and sacks of flour, ready for shipment to England as soon as winter conditions relaxed on the Rhine. In Worms, there's one of the world's finest monuments to those stirring days, the Great Luther Memorial. The center statue of Luther is surrounded by figures of other great reformers, including John Wycliffe. We now followed Tyndale to Marburg, a fine old university center in the heart of Germany. The whole town clusters around the slopes of a hill upon the crown of which stands a venerable castle, the residence in Tyndale's time of the overlord of the province of Hesse Castle. The overlord of that time was among the first to embrace the Reformation. He devoted himself wholeheartedly to the movement and acquired a position of great prominence amongst the reformers. Inspired with the desire to promote learning in his kingdom, he founded the university. Both the university and the ancient castle flourish to this day. Inside the castle is the setting of the great religious convention in October 1529. It's possible that Tyndale himself was present in these halls when the mysteries of the Christian faith were debated by the reformers with stormy animosity. A famous landmark of Marburg is the Church of St. Elizabeth, where those engaged in a heated debate at the castle may well have worshipped side by side in the quiet of this sanctuary. With its old Reformation church, there can be few cities in Europe so reminiscent of medieval times. The women and children still wear these picturesque costumes as they go about their daily work. In these surroundings, Tyndale resided in contentment. The university was inaugurated while he was here, and he was able to meet and converse with some of his own countrymen who came to Marburg to study. With the printing press of Hans looked at his disposal, Tyndale published some of his controversial works. Above all, by 1530, he had completed his new and immense task of translating the first five books of the Old Testament into English. Here is a page from his book of Genesis. Thus Tyndale passed his time amid the glories of Marburg, which remain unchanged to this day. Antwerp has always been an important continental port and is, of course, one of the nearest to England. Through its merchants and seamen, Tyndale was kept in close touch with events at home. Here it was that Bishop Tunstall purchased as many testaments as possible from a merchant named Packington in order to burn them in London. Packington, in turn, purchased them from Tyndale. Thus the story is told that the bishop had the books, 
Packington the thanks and Tyndale the money. Among this labyrinth of narrow streets, Tyndale found lodgings in what was known as the English House, a house given over by the town of Antwerp to the English merchants who traded there. The street may still be found. It's called the Street of the Old Market, and here is the site of the English House. Dwellings even older than the English house are still standing in the same street and serve to convey an impression of the surroundings and atmosphere which were familiar to Tyndale. Tyndale continued his printing activities in this vicinity, which is adjacent to the Plantin Museum. Established during Tyndale's time, this building was formerly a printing house of great repute, and today, houses what is claimed to be the finest collection of historic printing appliances in Europe. Tyndale made a practice of spending two days a week dispensing charity to the poor who lived in these streets in the shadow of the cathedral spire. And then the plot against his life was basely and cunningly contrived. The origin of the plot was not among the authorities in England, but its instrument was an Englishman, Henry Phillips, who was paid a sum of money to go to Antwerp to win the confidence of the unsuspecting Tyndale. We cannot force an entry here. Have I not told you I will cousin him out? You have your orders. I, Master Phillips. If it be this man Tinder with whom you come forth, you are to signal with your kerchief. When I so signal, then you step forth at once and apprehend him. Meantime, have care to keep within shelter of this wall. Master Tyndale within? Aye, indeed, sir. Aye. Sir, Master Phillips would have word with you. Master Phillips? Ah, my friend. What pleasure it is to have you here again in Antwerp. How fared you with your business? Well enough. And yet, alas, I come here as a beggar. You, a beggar? I indeed. Last night I spent in Mecklen. Coming on this morning, I found that I'd lost my purse in passage and must be seriously embarrassed unless you can accommodate me these few days. I will do what I can right gladly. But I cannot befriend you as I would were I moneyed. If you could lend me 40 shillings. That can I do, if it suffice you. It is ample. But it hurts me to rob you if you be so poorly off. I be not poorly off, Master Phillips. I would not have requested this of you had I not believed that you profited well from the sale of your translation. I have not worked for money. Nonetheless, friend, the scripture says the laborer is worthy of his hire. God's work is reward enough, and more than enough for so unworthy a servant. I thank him, I have not coveted one penny piece that the Testaments have earned. Master Tyndale, you shall be my guest to dinner this day. No, no. My host, good Master Points, is away from home on business, and this day I go forth to dine. You shall go with me, where you shall be welcome. They tarry a long time. It is said this man Tyndall hath escaped many such traps. What is this? You are William Tyndale? That is my name, sir. Have you business with me? The author of these translations of the Testaments that are exported to England? Aye, the same. Go on, go on, do your duty. We are to arrest you in the name of the Emperor, King Charles V. Do you question it? Nay, friend. 
Whither do you take me? We're to take you firstly to the Emperor's attorney, and thence to the castle of Beaufort to prison. Hasten! Hasten! Do you come with us? Renegade, heretic, the stake awaits you! Mine own familiar friend. His Excellency, the Governor. Master Tyndale, it is my duty to fetch you to your execution. Would you see the warrant? I thank you, there is no need. Why should I look on that which I've been awaiting these many months, and now I'm ready for? If you burn me, you shall do none other thing than that I look for. There is no other way into the kingdom of life but by suffering even unto death after the example of Christ. Your cloak. I shall not need it long enough. King of England's eyes. 